Hello, beautiful souls, and welcome to my channel. Hello and a warm welcome to our channel. Today, we're delving into Jose Marmelo. Jose Mara Dionisio Melo y Ortiz October 9, 1800 June 1, 1860 was a Colombian general and political figure who fought in the South American Wars of Independence and who rose to power and briefly held the presidency of Colombia in 1854. Of Pija ancestry, he is considered the country's first and only indigenous president. Joining the Revolutionary Army of Simon Bolivar in 1819, Mello distinguished himself in numerous battles of the Wars of Independence, including the decisive Battle of Icacho. During the collapse of Gran Colombia he was exiled to Venezuela. After participating in another failed revolution, Mello returned to Colombia in 1840 and became involved in the reformist political groups made up of middle-class artisans. He supported the presidency of José Hilario López, the first liberal to take power in the country. Amidst a schism in the Liberal Party and a deteriorating political situation in the capital, Mello took power in a coup d'etat in 1854. He ruled for eight months until he was overthrown by an alliance of conservatives and rival liberals. Once again exiled to Central America, Mello fought against the invasion of Nicaragua by American mercenary William Walker and pledged his support to Mexican President Benito Juarez at the outset of the Reform War. He was captured by conservative troops in Chiapas in 1860 and executed. Mello is a controversial figure in Colombian history. After his death, his regime was characterized as an apolitical military dictatorship and his role in the 19th century struggle between liberals and conservatives was generally minimized or forgotten. In the late 20th century, however, historians began to re-examine his legacy. In this section, we'll be deep diving into early life, unraveling its complexities and uncovering valuable insights. Jose Mara Dionisio Melo y Ortiz was born to Manuel Antonio Melo and Mara Antonia Ortiz in Chaparral, a small town in the Maraquita province of the Viroyalty of New Granada, on October 9, 1800. He was raised in Ibogu, the provincial capital. Melo was of indigenous Pija ancestry and is considered the only Colombian president with a strong claim to indigenous ancestry. Some historians have called the extent of this ancestry into question, noting that both his father and mother were listed by the census as white nobles who came from important families in the colonial towns of Cartago and Buga, respectively. Others have sought to distinguish Melo's ancestry from his political contemporaries, saying that unlike Bolva and Santanda, Melo was never considered part of the Criollo elite. Welcome to the next segment, where we explore wars of independence and its significance in our journey. Mello joined in the Patriot Army led by Simon Bolvar on April 21, 1819, commissioned as a lieutenant. The Liberation Army had crossed into Spanish-controlled New Granada modern-day Colombia from Venezuela earlier that year. Mello distinguished himself as a leader in combat, participating in battles at Popayan and Genie. He also fought in the Anpichincha in 1822, securing the independence of Ecuador, as well as Junan, Mata and Aicacho in 1824, securing the independence of Peru from the Spanish crown. Melo was also part of the army that besieged the fortress city of Cala in 1825, which ultimately saw the collapse of the last Spanish stronghold in South America. Now, let's dig deeper into Gran Colombia and unveil the hidden treasures it holds within. Mello remained with Bolvar's army after the final defeat of the Spanish. He participated in the war between Gran Colombia which included modern-day Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Panama and Peru which sought to Bolvar's army out of Bolivia. Mello fought in the Battle of Porta de Tarqui in 1829, which ended in stalemate between the Colombian and Peruvian forces. Though the war with Peru was resolved with the 1830 Treaty of Guayaquil, the political situation in Gran Colombia was rapidly deteriorating. Venezuela and Ecuador withdrew from the Union, and Bolvar resigned from the presidency of Colombia in 1830 to be replaced by the conservative Domingo Queso as president of the Republic of New Granada. 
In September 1830, General Rafael Urdaneta overthrew Caisto and formally requested Bulva's return. The attempt failed, and Caisto returned to power. Urdaneta and his supporters, Melo included, were imprisoned in the Castillo San Fernando in Cartagena before they were deported to Dutch Guerrilla in August 1831. As we enter this new phase, let's uncover the impact of first exile on our broader topic. Melo travelled to Venezuela, settling in Caracas. Here he married Adonita's sister-in-law, Mara Teresa Vargas y Paz. In Caracas, Melo was introduced to a group of military officers that favoured the restoration of Gran Colombia and opposed the separatist, conservative civilian government of José Mara Vargas. The group also opposed the continued influence of Cordillo and former President José Antonio Pease, who was considered a chief ideologue of Venezuela's separation from Gran Colombia. In 1835, the group, led by revolutionary hero Santiago Morio, rose up in what became known as the Revolution of the Reforms, demanding the restoration of Gran Colombia as well as various political and social reforms. Though they managed to depose Vargas, Pease raised an army and forced the rebels to evacuate Crocus. The surviving rebels went into exile, some to the Dutch Antilles, and others to Nicaragua. Mello went to Europe in December 1836. He studied at the military academy in Bremen, Lower Saxony, and became interested in socialist ideas debated in local circles. In particular, Mello was drawn to the early utopians, including Charles Fourier and Henry de Saint-Simon, as well as the proto-anarchist ideas of Pierre-Joseph Pravin and Louis Auguste Blanqui. Mello was also interested in the Chartist movement that emerged in England in 1838, and even the work of French socialist and suffragist Flora Tristan. As we venture forward, let's take a closer look at the democratic societies and its impact on our understanding. Mello returned to Colombia in 1841, after an amnesty offered by President José Ignacio de Merquez during the War of the Supremes. Despite his military training in Germany, he did not rejoin the army and instead settled in Ibogu, where he engaged in several commercial ventures and even taught classes at the. He eventually became a regional political leader. After returning to Colombia, Mello participated in the foundation of the democratic societies, political clubs that organized artisan workers and liberal intellectuals. The groups drew from the ideas of Saint Simon, Fourier, and French socialist politician Louis Blanc. They also organized readings of the Bible in Spanish, with radical interpretations reminiscent of 20th century liberation theology. The artisans also demanded tariffs on imports from industrialized countries like England and the United States, which they argued were detrimental to the development of national industry. They rejected the Malarino Bidlac Treaty signed by the administration of Tom's Cipriano de Mosquera, which allowed the US to intervene in Panama, which at the time was a Colombian province, to protect their economic interests. Get ready to immerse yourself in the world of liberal government and party schism as we examine its impact and relevance. Mello and the Democratic Societies supported the liberal General José Hilario Pérez in the presidential elections of 1849, which the liberals managed to win. The Pérez's platform encompassed many of the demands of the Democratic Societies, including the abolition of slavery and the separation of church and state. He also pursued issues like land reform and decentralization. In June 1849, President Lopez appointed Mello, who had rejoined the military in 1847, the commander of the Hussars Cavalry Corps, garrisoned in Bogot. In this capacity, Mello fought against the insurrection of 1851, where slave owners and conservatives led by Julio Arboleda Pombo took arms against the Lopez government in protest of the abolition of slavery. He was promoted to the rank of general and managed to raise a militia of 3,000 volunteers to suppress the rebellion in Cundinamarca, which was being led by Mariano Espina Rodriguez. Melo managed to defeat the rebels at Guasca, and after the rebellion was suppressed in the rest of the country, was named commander of military forces in Cundinamarca in June 1852. However, Mello broke with Lopez on the issue of the Resuados, or indigenous reservations. 
Mello and the democratic societies felt that dissolving the Reswado system, as Alpes proposed, would allow landowners to exploit indigenous as cheap labour for their plantations. The break was part of a larger schism within the Liberal Party between two factions. The ascendant faction were the Dolgotas, or Gold of the Liberals, who espoused a form of bourgeois socialism while holding free trade principles. They included figures like Jose Marsampa and Manuel Murillo Toro. Opposed to them were the Draconianos, or Draconian Liberals. This group believed that the Republican project could be safeguarded only with a centralized state and a protectionist economy. After the Civil War of 1851, Mello and the Democratic societies began to drift increasingly towards the Draconian camp, particularly due to the artisans' strong opposition to free trade. In August 1850, the artisans demanded protection and the creation of a national workshop supported by the government. Mello founded a newspaper, El Orden, in 1852. Though its intended readers were military officers and it railed against the Golgotha's proposals to reduce garrisons in urban centres, it became closely associated with both the draconian liberals and the artisans of the democratic societies. The publication attacked both the conservatives and the Golgothas, accusing them of planning to sell Panama to the United States and of scheming to exile prominent Draconians like Jose Mar Abando. Obando, representing the Draconians, was elected president in 1853. He promulgated the Constitution of 1853, which was unprecedented in Latin America at the time. It established a federal system, formalized the abolition of slavery, extended near-universal male suffrage, and provided for national elections decided by direct popular vote. Despite the Constitution's progressive nature, Obando and the Draconians were not entirely satisfied, aware that the document had been drafted by the Golgothas. In this chapter, we'll be shedding light on Quiro's affair and its role in shaping our understanding. In 1853 and 1854, Liberal Bogart became fractured between the artisans and the merchant class, especially after a tariff bill failed in the Golgotha-controlled Colombian Senate. The city was facing a severe food shortage, exacerbated by the tax law of 1853. Violent street battles occurred between the two groups, and a coup d'etat against Abando was discussed as a real possibility. This was the backdrop for the Quiro's affair in March 1854, where various political enemies of Mello accused the general of being responsible for the death of a corporal under his command. Pedro Ramon Quiroz, who was fatally wounded in a street brawl in January. Mello was said to have struck the corporal with his sword after he resisted arrest. In court, Mello produced evidence proving he was at regimental headquarters at the time, and also the deathbed testimony of Quiroz himself to exonerate himself. However, both the case's judge and the mayor of Bogotá, Lorenzo Gonzalez, were political opponents of Mello and sought to discredit this testimony. As the trial went on in April 1854, the situation in Bogot continued to deteriorate. Golgothas fought with Draconians in the streets, and armed artisans rallied to the slogan Pan, Tribajo, Omert Bread and Work, or Death. Vice President de Boulder, himself a Golgotha, recommended to President Abando that Mello be discharged from the army immediately in the name of preventing an insurrection, Obando declined. In the following section, we'll be immersing ourselves in the captivating world of eight-month presidency. On April 17, 1854, mobs of artisans stormed the houses of prominent senators in Bogot and placed them under arrest. The revolt origins are unclear, but some historians have concluded that it was masterminded by Miguel Lean, a prominent local blacksmith and president of the local Democratic Society Club. Whatever the case, Mello arrived with the artisans at the presidential palace at 7am, urging Abando to dissolve Congress and form an emergency provisional government. Abando refused, and he was placed under arrest. Mello proclaimed that his government was a rejection of the 1853 Constitution and the gold of the controlled Congress, which sought to impugn the army, the illustrious body of armed citizens that gave the people independence. He also declared that liberty shall not perish as long as I exist. 
similar artisans' revolts broke out in Cali and Popeyan, though the Golgothas and conservatives, who had fled to Ibogu and formed a provisional government, accused the artisans of forming an audacious military dictatorship headed by Mello, the uncouth soldier, his government enjoyed the strong support of the artisans. One artisan newspaper declared of the new government, we are free, we are democrats, and we did not abandon our workshops, our homes, and our families, only to give away our sovereignty to one man, we will not, for any price, exchange our title of citizens for that of subjects. Despite this support, Mello's regeneradors were outnumbered and outmatched by the constitutionalists, which had united Goldifers like Tums de Herrera with conservatives like Julio Arboleda and Tums Cipriano de Mosquera. Despite victories at Quiza and Zipaqua, Mello's effective control of the country was limited to Bogot, especially after Cali fell to the constitutionalists without resistance. In a climactic battle south of the capital, San Diego y Los Nieves, Melo's army was decisively defeated and Miguel Lean, one of the regime's chief ideologues, was killed. After Melo was militarily defeated, his soldiers and artisans were severely repressed. The only military survivors of the artisans' revolution were 200 participants, banished on foot to Panama after their property was confiscated. Conservatives in particular regarded the punishment as an excellent method of purging Bogot of the democratic pest, in the words of José Manuel restrepo -Veles. Let's now shift gears and explore final exile and death through a critical lens, uncovering its strengths and weaknesses. Mello was put on trial and was ultimately expelled from the country for a period of eight years. There were some agitating for his execution, but this was avoided thanks to the intervention of certain Goldithers who pushed for clemency, including Manuel Murillo Toro, who paid his bail. He sailed for Costa Rica on October 23, 1855. Though his whereabouts immediately after his exile are unclear, historians believe that he participated in the Central American resistance against the American filibuster William Walker who sought to create a slave republic in Nicaragua. After the victory over Walker, Mello worked as an instructor of troops in El Salvador. He briefly moved to Guatemala before falling out with the country's dictator, Rafael Carrera. Mello crossed the Mexican border on October 10, 1859. At the time, Mexico was engulfed in the War of the Reform, another conflict between liberals led by Benito Juarez and conservatives. Mello sought to offer his services to Juarez directly, but was unable to reach the liberal seat of government in Veracruz due to conservative activity in Oaxaca. Instead, he was sworn into the liberal army by the governor of Chiapas, Ingel Albino Corzo. Mello was named chief cavalry officer of the military department of Comitán, which operated on the Mexico-Guatemala border. He sought out to train his men, most of them to jollible Indians in the art of cavalry warfare. On June 1, 1860, Mello's cavalry troops, encamped at the Junkin Hacienda in La Trinitaria, were ambushed by the conservative forces of General Juan Antonio Ortega. After several hours of fighting, the Juarista defense collapsed and the wounded Mello was captured by rebel forces. Ortega ordered Mello to be put to death, and the Colombian general was summarily executed by firing squad. Mello's position in the Liberal Army was taken by José Pantón Domingos, who managed to suppress the conservative uprising in Chiapas. He was survived by his son, Miximo Mello Granados, who married the daughter of the governor of Chiapas, Ingo Albino Corzo, and remained in Mexico. Remember to follow me on social media for behind-the-scenes content and updates.